Carry on. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Joan Th Jo Thornton. Um, unfortunately, Rebecca Warren couldn't be with us this afternoon. She's poorly. But every cloud, because I brought along um, my colleague, who is also a paediatric respiratory nurse, and we actually do a lot of collaborative working together. So I'll let you introduce yourself. So I'm Georgina. I'm one of the um, children's respiratory nurses at ELHT. So I am one half of sport. Now, a lot of people have asked me, do I just get children to run round? Mm -hmm. It's not the answer. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is what sport is. Uh, we're going to look at conditions that we uh, assess and treat, um, treatment techniques, a few case studies, what outcomes we utilise, and also a, uh, an opportunity they've got to do uh, with an educational outreach. So it's a very, that's why we're using an acronym, it's very long-winded. We're a specialist paediatric outreach respiratory team. We're a seamless service, um, and we were initially piloted for 12 months uh, with the CCGs. Fortunately, we have been running for over four years now, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, we were just East Lancs, but we've taken on Blackburn with Darwin. Um, we've had excellent feedback and cost savings. Now, I've got to say at this point, I love my job, and I have a fantastic opportunity in my job, but this service that we have is very rare. Tertiary centres have quite a lot of outreach respiratory teams. We... District generals don't. So obviously this is something that we were so proud when we pushed through after the year that it was absorbed into ELHT. So we treat patients between zero and 18 years old. Uh, cystic fibrosis and PCD patients, bronchiectasis, complex knee patients, asthma with or without hyperventilation. And we work in a community, uh, a variety of settings including community, outpatients, inpatients, and within schools. And our aims, we set this up over four years ago and they haven't changed. So we aim to reduce long-term healthcare costs, avoid hospital admissions and length of stay. We can actually bring children out earlier, ideally, and follow them, them up within community or an outreach or out, outpatients follow-up. Improve function and outcomes. Um, one of the things that we were discussing on the way here is, yeah, we're looking at cost savings, looking at financial implications, but the subjective quality of life is immeasurable to me. Um, and that, to me, on the patient function and outcome is really, really important. We want to look at deterioration of respir respiratory conditions that could be managed at home. Why are we bringing them into hospital if we can keep them out there in the community? Exercise testing with appropriate advice asthma management, and also what is, help, what is happening with poor compliance with physiotherapy, which might be in influencing everything that we're aiming for. So I'm not going to go mad on it, but we are looking, we do treat neurological children, neurological and neuromuscular weaknesses. And I think the main thing is at the bottom, the respiratory failure is the most common cause of mortality in these patients. It's not their neurological condition, unfortunately, it's the respiratory failure. So, what's in our toolbox? We have a lot of stuff. I'm not going to go into detail about it, but the main thing is we are responsive to urgent visits if required. We can go out within 24 hours. Um, and we communicate greatly with our consultants because obviously we need to work with them. Can we keep that child at home? Or actually, do we need to step them up into care? Do they need medical management? Are the parents thinking, oh, no, they're not as bad as they, th as they seem? Or actually, no, let's ring them through to COAU. Let's get them on the ward and get some treatment. And also, if we can bring them home a bit earlier as well. So there's loads of stuff in our toolbox that we use. Quite often, we will, um, the main ones is a cough assist. And we also do suctioning. But we do suction training as well. So it's all right giving a, a family suction, but they need to know how to use it. Carers need to know how to use it. Grandparents need to know how to use it. Get the school staff need to know how to use it. Um, we do test microbiology, we do test doses, and we do look if children need near, um, overnight uh, ventilation. So Sam is a five-year-old spinal muscular atrophy type 2 patient, and he's had approximately 10 admissions into hospital in 2015-16. We've got a cough assist and a suction machine supplied for oral clearance, training, school training, urgent responsive visits, communication with our MDT, and collaborative working with Alder Hay. And he's had no admissions in the last 18 months. 
it's we work on patient centred goals, and we had obviously excellent family f uh, feedback for, from from all the family. But like I say, it's improving that quality of life for that family. We have great working relationships with the family to improve that compliance. We want them to stick at it every day. Um, and obviously, a massive financial impact. So cystics and bronx, we historically saw on the ward and in clinic. That was your lot. But we have excellent benefits to observing home surroundings. So where's your spacer? I don't know. <laughs> Are you using it every day? Yeah. <laughs> but right. still can't find it. But still can't find it. Where's your flutter device? Where's your aerobica? Uh, I don't know. When was the last time they actually used that device? And it's brilliant to go into homes. I had one um, that sister, mum and child, yes, yes, we do our physio, yes, every day. And sister, um, she don't do it, you know. She never does it. <laughs> so are we getting a bit more of an insight into actually what's going on? So we review airway clearance te techniques um, and we work towards independence, which I'll bring up later. And we work in outpatients, community and schools if they ask for it. Do a lot of joint working with you guys. Um, and we want to streamline treatments. The problem is with um, cystics and bronch patients, you're not giving them something that will make them better. You're giving something that will maintain them. And if they hit that wall... Where do they go? Don't know. So if we go together, we do a lot of joint working that we can streamline. We can get ideal uh, medicines um, as well as nebulizers, as well as treatments that we want to combine that they do all in the right order. Um, exercise programs that we wanted to get them up and about because exercise is one of the main things for our cystics. And we do yearly exercise testing, which is part of our CF guidelines. So, who remembers pat, 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 pat with CF patients? Still do it for our little ones because they can't do it themselves. And active cycle of breathing, so get the air in, get it round that sputum, get it huffed, get it out. But also exercise can move that sputum as well, so that's a really, really important thing for families. But now we have a lot of stuff where we can give them where they can be independent, four or five-year-old there on. We don't have to wait for mum to come and pat. We don't have to wait for grandma or granddad or dad to be available. So we can give what we call the flutter or positive airway pressure devices, acapellas, aerobicas, so it moves that speech and they can sit and do it themselves. But also we do nebulizers, which is nebulized antibiotics, hypertonic saline and donors, which all work on helping move and get that sputum out. Medicine management, obviously we work very closely with you guys, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Um, and microbiology. Obviously, we know there's issues with microbiology with children with cystic fibrosis and bronx. It's not just about avoiding coming into contact with each other, but we do a lot of work on sort of pseudomonas yeah, and yeah. reducing that risk, don't we? Um, and also housekeeping. We need them to clean their equipment. It's all right keeping children separate from other CF children um, and making sure that the taps run for 30 seconds every morning. But if that device is not washed and boil washed once a week, where are we going to be at? We're go they're going to grow them bugs. And the other thing, I don't know where the pictures come out brilliantly, with the PCDs, we do actually start introducing nasal douches or nasal washers that actually clear out and help. They tend to get a lot of um, mucus in the nose that actually help clear out uh, the nasal area as well. So this was a... a, a, art, a piece of work that Cheryl, um, who was one of our previous physios, actually worked on. And it's working towards independence. And I really like this um, piece of work that she did because we're looking at do the, pa you know, age appropriate chest clearance. Are patients aware of what they need to be doing? Inhaler and nebulizer, are they aware of what they need to be doing? And also communication. So we might have a child who is brilliant at airway clearance and knows it off by heart at seven years old. And we might have a patient who, yeah, is really good with their inhalers and the nebulizers. Don't actually get involved in supervising, helping mum put it together. Fine, we can work on that. But actually, sit in clinic and don't say a thing. That's an area we can work on. 
So it's actually promoting all of their independence. And one of the reasons why I tend to use this, especially as a teenager who um, often sit there and go, well, I don't put it together because my mum does it and I don't wash it because my dad does it. So you're 16 and you're going to university in two years' time. Who's going to do it then? Well, I don't know. So we need to move them on as well. So this is, if we start off really, really young, the, with this working towards independence sheet, the whole way through. And we bring it up every now and again, and it's something we can really focus goals on. So ben, um, Ben's actually gone into adult um, treatment now, but massive lack of motivation. Family history of no interest in a form of exercise whatsoever. How are we going to make, motivate him into getting up and doing something? So using his exercise test as um, a goal, we utilise that to do a short run twice a week. So that was me and him round the block. Walk, run, walk, run until we progressed it into a full run. And we're now developing more independence with his airway clearance. But... The, the wonderful thing is dad was allowing him to then go and do his run independently as long as he checked in back with dad every block he did. So it was absolutely brilliant. So outcomes for CF Bronx, we have annual exercise testing, patient centre goals, feedback from family is fantastic. Again, that quality of life is just, um, it, it, it's fantastic for families, parents and siblings. Good working relationship with families, and that, again, in itself can improve compliance and communication to MDT because, obviously, they come into clinic, they need to communicate with the MDT. So asthma, a whole new area for us when we started sport. Um, we have close links with the respiratory nurses, which um, Georgina is going to talk about in a minute. But we need to understand... We're trying to improve the understanding of the role, the dosage of inhalers, but also, as a physio point of view, getting that inhaler deep down, that deposition. We look at exercise, um, education and programmes. If children are swaying off doing activity, why? Can we get them back into it? I never want a child to stop doing activity, ever. Um, we contrib contribute to the MDT assessment and also general asthma education to children, families, and we're going to schools. So I'm going to briefly talk about the giant respiratory clinics that we've done with sport. Um, they came about really at the beginning of the year, didn't they? Um, we sort of found that we were seeing the same sort of patients, treating them for different elements on each side, but overlapping as well. So what we found was that one child might have an appointment with myself um, at the beginning of the week and then at the end of the week it, he'd have an appointment with Joe um, and then we found that there were lots of DNAs cancelling the day before because obviously they'd already been to hospital um, and it, it was it's an increase of hospital appointments, time off work, time off school, the cost to get to hospital. Uh, so we decided we'd set some clinics up, some joint clinics which are run once a week in the afternoons. Uh, one day a week. So we started them in May this year. Um, obviously, it prevents duplication of um, assessment. It reduces the number of appointments for the child and family. Um, and we've also seen a major reduction in DNAs and cancellations as well, which is fantastic. For us, it reduces consultation time, but also the child and family. It improves the patient experience, so we've had some fabulous feedback yeah, from it. Yeah. And as I've just mentioned, it reduces time off school and work for parents. Um, and it promotes con consistent advice as well. They're seeing two different healthcare pr um, professionals, but saying the same thing, which I think has a massive yeah, it's impact. Really important. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a lot of patients can come to us where they've had different input with different advice about their asthma and about their inhalers and about the spacer. And they're confused. They don't know yeah. who to believe and what to believe. So... We try, obviously, keep up to date with the most recent evidence, and if both of us are singing from the same song sheet, then it is promoting that consistent advice. So we'll start. This is this is the picture one for you. So we're going to start in the bot your bottom left. So we starting. We are, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Becky. So it's Becky um, who's off today, and I'm standing in for. Um, there she is um, assessing. Um, the patient. Um, we, we tend to do a full clinical initial assessment to start with um, and then we go on to the medications, the use of the devices, which device is best for that child 
every um, clinic that they attend, we check their inhaler technique because it differs from appointment to appointment massively. We always do the lung functions for a baseline, but we also can use that later on for management of the care. Um, and then we have Becky again, um, breathing exercises, position of ease. And then in the top right, we've got us, it, it's the major part, the education, education, education. Uh, we talk about the asthma action plans, um, how to you know, effectively deal with an exacerbation, inhaler techniques, recognizing the triggers, um, avoidance, and what the medications are for, what they do, and how and when they should be using them as well. So as physios, we do look at managing exacerbations um, and the education and treatment to, to try and help them. So um, what's the first thing you do if you can't breathe properly? Panic. Panic. Everybody would. So what we want to try and do is reduce that panic to reduce uh, hyperventilation. So we look at positioning. We look at positions of ease. Um, we look at breathing control. Can we use that diaphragm rather than a <laughs> quick breathing and not, not really ventilating, just using apical um, breathing? Distraction technique and also relaxation. Once we get that breathing, that diaphragmatical breathing under control, what, what techniques do they have that we've taught that they can use to distract and relax? Because what's the one thing you find if you can't breathe? You tell yourself you can't breathe and then you can't breathe, and then you can't breathe. So what we want to do is distract that. So for the little is, what I tend to do is I teach elephant breathing. So I get them to put their arm out. So this is the trunk. And we slide down their arm for a big breath in through the nose. And then we blow it away. But what's this doing in front of them? It's distracting them. And they love it. Another thing that we do do is exercise testing. Now, I do exercise testing for cystics as a, as a routine thing, but we quite often get requests for exercise testing. Um, this is... Um, just a sec. Yeah. Um, this is for often people who have issues with exercise. So, is it they've had an exacerbation and they just, I can't do it? Or is it anxious parents who have gone, I've took them out of PE? because they're really struggling. No, no, it's not happening. But what I want to do when we're doing exercise test is the parents is observing that child and they can actually see if they struggle. We do the lung functions. Are they struggling before? Are they struggling afterwards? Can we do breathing control afterwards to actually realize that that child can calm themselves down? And it's reassuring the child, but it also reassures the parents. And it gives them the confidence, doesn't it? It does. And if we're lacking that confidence, that's what we want to really aim for. Um, the other thing that we've really looked at with exercise testing as well is um, we do reversibility testing. So we test a child with spirometry and then we give them five puffs, ten puffs of inhaler and we test them again. Is that airway going to change if we've not given them a trigger? No. So... We get them exercising, we do the lung functions before, we get them to do a bleep test, and then we look at the lung functions, and actually if it's dropped below a certain percent, we know that trigger has caused a reduction in the airways, then we give them the inhaler, does that work? Yes, we've got a brilliant improvement. Parents and children are happy that that inhaler does what it says on the tin. So quite often we will try and bring them in if they're unwell, you know, when they're unwell. We want them to ring us when they're unwell. We want to tr do a reversibility test because quite a lot of parents go, it don't work, it, it doesn't help, don't it? it doesn't their inhaler. Well, or on the flip side, it's, are they really unwell? Are they really unwell? We want to see that they want in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if we can do a reversibility, it gives the parents that confidence and the child that confidence that it works. So breathing control and hyperventilation, around 50% are more affected with asthmatic children, but it's more significant in adolescents. The little is six, seven, eight, if they've had a, a, a real poor attack, an exacerbation, they're really struggling, they can start hyperventilating, but your, uh, your adolescents tend to be the ones that get into that hyperventilative stage. And is it actually your asthma 
or your hyperventilation. So we want to try and get them to identify it. Because asthma medicines do not treat hyperventilation. So how many times... It's not going to work. It's not going to change anything. But actually, if you can identify the symptoms of hyperventilation and calm yourself down, you've more control over it and you don't need to be pumping full of inhaler. So we're looking at financial savings as well. So treatment includes identifying symptoms, breathing control, uh, distraction and relaxation, and of course, positions of ease. They're out with the mates and they're really struggling. Do they want to be conscious that they're really struggling? Get them lent over someone's front wall. Get them lent on a lamppost. Get them somewhere where they're not conscious. Get the phone out. They can be playing on the phone even though they're struggling. But they're actually leaning against something or actually sporting the self rather than <gasps> in the middle of a street. So outcome measures that we use, um, we've had a reduction in a very high intensity users to secondary care and a reduction in attendance and admission. We use, again, patient-centred goals, and we have what we call a care document that, we, that patients and families um, uh, use for feedback. We've had great results from that. Exercise testing results. We do use spirometry regularly, and PSFIS, which is a patient-specific func functional index scale that is something we use in physiotherapy. So just a couple of um, case studies. So a known asthmatic, five admissions to A&E within two months. Um, he only re required two sessions. Um, no further admissions following our input and improvement to quality of life. Obviously, financial savings, massive impact. Nine-year-old um, brittle asthmatic, repeated admissions on massive levels of medication. Five siblings and mum was actually sleeping in his room. Um, significant hyperventilation on assessment. We taught him self-management strategies, brilliant compliance, no admissions, and marked quality of life for him and his siblings and mum. And mum just said she's moved out of his bedroom. They're both getting improved sleep. Um, rarely has to use his inhaler, where he'll do his breathing control instead after football. I'll pass you to Georgina. Learn live. Well, we had the opportunity, didn't we, to, um, well, following the Asthma Friendly Schools Initiative, um, part, part of the CCGs have asked us to attend and be part of the Learn Live, which is live broadcasts. So that's your digital for you. Um, it was myself and Joe who was asked questions. We have 42 schools involved across East Lancashire. Um, you know, we were accessing a captive paediatric audience, but we also had teachers asking lots and lots of questions too, which was fantastic. We initially did one broadcast, um, which was absolutely had fantastic success. So we did another one. Um, the feedback wasn't showed... Wasn't scary, wasn't the second oh, one? No, was it wasn't. It? it was terrible, the first one. <laughs> the feedback showed information on medication management and correct inhaler technique was needed. Um... Hence why we did the second one. Um, following that, we ran out of time on the second one. Um, so There's we just so many questions, yeah, wasn't yeah. there? So we, we had to answer all the questions after the actual the broadcast had finished. Um, we found that it enabled a lot of children were asking about their friends with asthma. So we were able to give that advice around, you know, how to support your friends, what to do, have they got an asthma action plan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, it was good. I'll let you talk this one. So just to show you how we did the Learn Live, so Stuart was in one of the rooms and he was getting all the questions fed back from all the schools. Um, so the, the teachers, the staff and the pupils were all feeding these questions in. He was then firing it round to us. So we were in front of him on a computer and then we, we had a camera in front of us, didn't we, where yeah. we had to ask, answer all the questions. We had a lot of equipment with us as well, our spaces, inhalers, uh, personal asthma plan and... Because we did um, demonstrations as well. Yeah, we which did were demonstrations yeah. with it. But, um, yeah, just the amount of questions that we got asked just showed how popular it really was. So, to contact us if you ever need to, there are our contact details. And thank you very much.
I would actually give a testimony because I work closely with, yeah. with your team. I've got some of those fragile children, and I think it's fantastic because they've been kept so much better. The other thing is that because they know the children, yeah. they can actually make an assessment and see are they good or bad. And sometimes some of the junior doctors don't realise that my children don't get respiratory distress. And so they might miss that the child's very poorly. So it's an absolute fantastic service that we should have across Lancashire and South Cumbria. Yeah. Any questions for the team? How did you go about um, securing the funding? Because it's like we're in a position where we'd like to do something similar, and obviously I'm sure a lot of other areas would, but how did you get to the point where you secured like interest and funding because I think people agree that it, it works but how did you get to actually implement it? I'm really glad you've asked that only because it's a bit twofold. When we set it up it was Natasha Pickering and uh, Cheryl who went I think to put the business plan together and went to the CCGs um, with our business case. However um, that was I think it was five and a half years uh, previously. I'm actually part of a special interest national um, group of the APCP. Um, I'm on the committee and we've actually set up a commissioning tool to be able to put evidence towards that. So I'll have a word we have to do with Garth, but it's on the APCP website. If you go to the um, special interest uh, respiratory committee um, and have a look on there, there is a commissioning tool um, because we were getting so many people asking us just that question, especially at conference, because everyone's crying out for it. I ran a course in Edinburgh um, and every, uh, uh, from neuro point of view and everybody asked for it, so yeah. Just shifting the room further to the back. And I wonder if you, before you go, you want to connect up with Steve, because Steve is very much involved with this. <laughs> Again, uh, our physiotherapy workforce is struggling to even cope with uh, the CPIPs, which has been nationally or most places have taken on board of for uh, uh, screening uh, for hip surveillance. So I just wondered how was the workforce generated for this extra work or uh, how, yeah. I wasn't involved in the initial business plan. I just applied for the job and ran the service. So um, it's going back a few years yeah. now, but um, it was it was a pilot that grew grew sort of quite quickly. And what I was able to do was to align it with the core physiotherapy service, um, which gave it. So it wasn't a pilot anymore, it's just part of an already existing core service provision. Um, so it's just a sort of a contract variation and I sort of not smuggled it through exactly, but it, the outcome sort of paid for itself, not just sort of the, the clinical outcomes, but the social outcomes as well. And obviously high quality services generally pay for themselves. So it had an economic argument as well. And it's really quite helpful and quite reassuring that today, sort of five, six years on all of that, you know, is, is coming to fruition. So ideally, as Christian said, it, it's something that's working well in, in an area of Lancashire. It makes complete sense that we would look at and link to what Julie was saying before regards to commissioning arrangements. It's something that you'd be looking to commission once across a bigger footprint. And I think it's opportunities like this today to, to listen and learn from pockets of good practice. But realistically, if there is something that is so so well received from both patients and practitioners, it, it makes absolute sense that we'd be looking to streamline and, and put this across a wider footprint. So I think we can get hung up a lot on, on money. Um, I've not got bags and bags of money. You know, I think everyone's trying to make efficiencies all over, but as I said, it, if you get high quality services and you reduce duplication, you improve efficiencies, they generally pay for themselves. So ideally we try and keep the money bit out of it and if it's the right thing to do and it's it's good practice and it's something that we really as commissioners um, should be looking to commission. Yeah. 
how did you manage to say your consultation time, I assumed by putting common sense, two people looking at one child, though should increase rather than reduce, but you said your consultation time reduced rather than increased. So we run joint clinics together, we'll both sit in a clinic. So even though it's an hour, both of our time, it's not two hours separate. So, and also from there, we're able to diverse. So if it's purely medical management, I take a step back, Georgina will take on board. If it's purely breathing control, hyperventilation, Georgina will take a step back. And I, or do we both need to do it together? But also, are we then, if we've got DNAs and they don't turn up, one of us is sat there towards the end of the week going, oh, I wonder why this patient hasn't turned up. And it's actually that they've been already. <laughs>